Thank you, Arlene. It is uh, yeah, a, little, a little tricky this morning. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, many preachers have covered Abraham uh, over the course of 10 or 12 weeks. And uh, so we are going to get Abraham in, uh, in one. And then we are going to fast forward to the Passover. So, um, so if you, in your reading plan, as you go through the, uh, the Bible this year, you're, probably, you're already uh, past the Passover. We will catch up to you next week. And so that's going to be the nature of this uh, process as we journey through the Bible. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time in Genesis 1 through 11 because the foundation of our Christian worldview is laid in Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, we see in that five significant truths that, first of all, God is the creator. Everything that we see is here because God spoke and said, let there be light and there is light. Why is there sin and suffering and death in our world? It traces back to Genesis 3 and the rebellion of man. The fall of man is the moment that our world cracked on its foundation. But God in that moment, he had promised to punish sin, and he followed through to punish sin, showing his faithfulness. But in the midst of that curse upon the serpent, there was the promise of hope in a line of blessing, a child, a distant descendant who would crush the head of this serpent. So even as God follows through on his promise to punish sin, he always provides a way of salvation, which we saw a couple weeks ago in that great story of Noah and the ark. And then we saw last week with the Tower of Babel that God is at war with idolatry. We'll see that next week in the Passover as God demonstrates his supremacy over all of the gods of mighty Egypt. God is at war with all other false gods. So that's the foundation of where we've been. Now we come to Genesis 12, the turning point of the book of Genesis. And from there to the end of the book, we will be talking about one man's family. The man's name is Abram. We meet him in Genesis 12. We know him as Abraham. The, the words are very similar, but the exalted father Abram will later be renamed, as God likes to do, Abraham, the father of a multitude. Father of a multitude. And his wife Sarai, whose name means princess, will be renamed mother of a multitude, which is the name Sarah. So, here we, we see all the way back from Genesis 3, the promise of an offspring. A child of Adam and Eve would be born one day who would crush the head of the serpent. Our hope all the way back to the fall of man is in this promise that God said, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and your offspring, and her offspring. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Our hope is in this wounded Savior. Wounded Savior, the offspring who is to come. And then we arrive in Genesis 12, and we see this foundational promise. From this promise, the nation of Israel was born. This moment right here, Genesis 12, I will make of you, God says to Abram, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and Make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. My prayer this morning is that we will hear these words for us. That you will hear this promise from God and, and feel the fulfillment of it. God says to each one of, it, of us in this room, I will bless you. And you will be a blessing. You feel the significance of that? And as we as we look at the life of Abraham, think about this. You know, he's seventy five years old when God calls him. Seventy, not a young man. Seventy five years old, God calls him and makes this promise that he would be a great nation. And he would have to wait twenty five years. And God didn't give him a ticker and a countdown clock to say just a couple more years. No, God just made a promise. And then Abraham had to wait an indefinite, unspecified period of time that we know was 25 years. He didn't know that. And halfway through, you have this whole thing with Ishmael. Okay? So here's our summary today. We look at the story of Abraham. We feel that promise. God comes to him and says, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. Unconditional, irrevocable promise. But in the middle of that timeline, 
Instead of waiting for Isaac, Abraham gives birth to Ishmael. How often do we do that? Instead of waiting for our Isaac, for the blessing God wants to give us, we take hold of what looks like a blessing in front of us, and that, of course, is life in the flesh or idolatry. Do you feel that? God says to us today, I will bless you. And of course, what we'll see is that he has blessed us. What for Abraham was 2,000 years in the future, for us is 2,000 years in the past. He has blessed us in fulfillment of this. And he is already using us to be a blessing to the nations. But I want you to feel this personally. Whatever you're dealing with right now, God says to you, I will bless you. You will be a blessing, but we have to follow this pathway that God gave to Abraham, the pathway of faith. We have to learn from his mistakes and not turn from the pathway of faith into the flesh and give birth to more Ishmaels, though no doubt we all have done that any number of times. Put yourself in Abraham's place. If you were 75 years old, I'm tempted to ask if there's anyone here who's 75. Don't worry, there's anyone. If you were 75 years old and God showed up and in an unmistakable way said, you are going to not just have a baby, but through you a whole nation will be born. Would you have the faith to believe that promise? Even now, even now, 42 years old, if God came to me and said, Kristen is going to have, you got four boys, that's nothing. There's a nation coming, right? I would say, well, Lord, you got some biological issues to be working against, right? Which is the same thing Abraham and, and Sarah, that, that they, they would have said. Well, you know, Lord, we, we've been married a long time. He's 75. Sarah at that point was 65. We haven't had babies yet. So that, that means there's some issues. There's some, you know, this, this, this ain't going to happen. Would you have had the faith to believe that? And if you were tested in the way that Abraham was, your wife comes to you with this offer of a maidservant that you kind of noticed, you know, would you be tempted by that if... Think fast forward then to Isaac. Okay, 25 years go by and you have the fulfillment of this promise. Here's the long-awaited child and he's now a teenager. He's growing up. All your hopes and dreams are invested in him. This is the blessing. This is the child of promise. And God says to you, okay, take him over this mountain and offer him to me as a sacrifice. I mean, put yourself in Abraham's position. It's easy for us as we read this account. And we say 75 years old, and we turn the page, and now he's 86, and we turn the page, and now he's 99. That doesn't seem so hard, Abraham. <laughs> Have you waited for anything for 25 years? I mean, can you imagine? Just walk in his shoes for a minute and feel what faith must feel like. How many, as we look back on our lives, how many Ishmaels have we given birth to? How many times, instead of waiting... On God's way and on God's plan and trusting him to bless us in the way that he wants. How many times have we taken matters into our own hands and said, I know I should save up for that car or that purchase, but I want it now. And I can put it on a credit card. How many of us have financial Ishmaels in our background, right? How many relational Ishmaels do we have in our background? Instead of waiting for that person that God has for you and trusting in his timing and his way, we... We're drawn to whoever that first person is who pays attention to us and the consequences we carry with us for years. How many times have God, has God said, there's a conflict between you and someone. You need to go and work out that conflict. But instead of obeying in faith, we let the conflict fester. How many Ishmaels are following after you? That's called life in the flesh. Life of self-reliance, like we looked at last week, self-focus and self-exaltation, the life of idolatry. The story of Abraham in this passage from Genesis 12 through 22, and really the whole book of Genesis, invites us to the pathway of faith. What we'll see in, in the story of Abraham is this exhortation to trust in the promises of God. That's why I want you to hear that. God says to you, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. Hear that as a personal promise from God to you today. God has blessings in store for you. Of course, the ultimate one is Jesus. 
He says, look, I have already fulfilled this promise. I have blessed you. This is the blessing you're going to pass on, but it applies to every other area of life too. God says, I want to bless you. I want to give you life in abundance, but you have to wait for me. You have to walk in my way and in my timing, trusting in me. Here's the pathway of faith. Hold on to this. Follow the pathway of faith in order to experience the rewards of faith. Those are the two parts of our message today. We'll see from Abraham the pathway, what faith looks like, and then the great rewards when we walk in it. This is the place to stand. This is the place to rest. We saw last week with the Tower of Babel that idolatry is the thing to avoid. We need to turn away from our false gods and our false idols, and we need to take hold of the better promises of God. Every temptation is a false promise. It's a lie from the devil that says life is over here, blessing is over here, and we believe that lie, and we take the bait, and we go off the path of faith and into the life of the flesh, and that's where Ishmael's come from. The call of God is to stay on the path, to trust in him even when things don't make sense, to stand firm on this point that we know God has promised and he is faithful. To me, it's a picture of you're building your life like a house. This is the foundation. This is what we stand firm upon, that our God is faithful. We say of his faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. If, if you're reaching for something to hold on to, you know that idolatry can be like a life preserver and you're looking for something to hold on to and you hold on to money or a person or a goal or an achievement. No, hold on to this. Hold on to the promises of God. As you study God's word, you'll see them over and over in the pages of scripture where God speaks to you and says things like this. I will bless you. You will be a blessing. Hold on to this. That's the foundation for the house that we are building. Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. This is the rock. Hearing the words of God and believing them to the point that we obey them. Picture to me of like you zoom in on that house. There's the foundation, this firm, unshakable foundation that is the promises of God. And you zoom in to the bedroom and there's a bed there. There's a memory foam, select comfort, sir, whatever, that you can rest in called the promises of God. This is not just our firm foundation. This is our place of rest and security and peace in the Lord and in his promises. So let's walk through this with Abraham the pathway of faith. Five steps of faith. The first one is to repent. The Lord called Abraham in Genesis 12, 1, to go. Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you. The first step for Abraham was to leave Haran where his family had moved in and had resettled in to turn his back on his past life, on his extended family, on his homeland, and to go into some place un. No. Joshua 24 fills in for us that long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Abraham is in the line of promise, right? There's a line of blessing from Adam to Noah, from Noah through Shem to Abraham, a line of blessing, a line of righteousness, the line of hope, the offspring that would come that would crush the head of a serpent. But Abraham and his family had fallen away from that life of righteousness and of following Seth and Enosh and calling on the name of the Lord in faith and giving glory to their creator. And instead, they had turned to the worship of other gods. They had followed in the path of Babel, of Babylon, devoting themselves to the worship of false gods. So when God calls Abram to leave his country and his homeland and his kindred, it's not about geography. It will be as he gets to the promised land, but it's about worship. Leave behind your worship of other gods. Sever all ties. Break all past allegiances. That is the beginning of faith. To repent. To make a clear and thorough repentance. Have you done that? Have you repented? One of my favorite things if I sit down with you individually is to draw a line down the middle of the paper and, and ask you, what's your before and after? Can you see your life before Jesus? 
And how you belong to your sin. You were a slave to your sin. You were driven by goals that had nothing to do with God. And after Jesus, after you committed to him and you made that break with the false gods and idols of your past, now you're a different person. You're on a different path. You're following after Jesus. It's all about him. Do you see that? If, if you can do that, if you can draw a line down a paper and see, this is who I was, this is who I am, then you have a clear line of repentance. If that's an exercise that you're thinking that might be difficult for you, I'd encourage you to do that exercise with someone you trust soon. Begin to think about that. What is your before and after? What false gods have you turned away from? And what does it mean for you to worship only the one true God? Because the second step is called commitment. Commitment, a clear line. There's nothing, aren't you seeing this in the Old Testament? There's nothing fuzzy or vague or abstract about the things that God gives us, right? In the garden, it's a fruit. You either eat the fruit or you didn't. With the boat, it's, it's the ark. You're either on the ark or you're not. Here, we, we come to Abraham. We're not going to dwell on this point. But the sign of the covenant was nothing vague or abstract, Right? It was very personal, it was very painful, and it was a permanent mark on your body. Here's what it says. This is my covenant, God says to Abraham, which you shall keep between me and you, your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. If you're not familiar with that word, ask your small group leader or one of the other elders. <laughs> the point of covenant is that it is more than a contract. We think contractually. We think, I do this, you do that. A covenant is much stronger than that, much deeper than that. It is a binding, <coughs> relational promise. The closest we can come to understanding a covenant is a marriage. Where man and woman make vows to each other. And through those vows, a relational bond is formed. The two become one in marriage. That's the best picture of what's happening here between God and Abraham. God is making a solemn promise... And the ring, in a sense, the sign of that union is called circumcision. It is a clear line. There is a definite before and after. There is a painful intermediate thing. Personal, painful, permanent, and in the Bible, we're going to get into this, bloody. Blood as the sign of the covenant. Now, in our new covenant, we have a different sign. It's called baptism. Baptism is the sign. It's that this is the line that is drawn. If you've made a commitment to Jesus, but you've not been baptized, I'd encourage you to really wrestle with that. Schedule a meeting. I'd love to talk with you. Talk with your small group leader or one of the elders about that. Don't worry about circumcision. Talk about baptism. Have you been baptized by immersion. Think about what it means when you go underwater. To go underwater, Romans 6, study that. Romans 6, 1 through 6. To go underwater is a symbol that your old self, your fleshly old self, has died. Crucified with Jesus, dead and buried with him. That old you is gone. Theologically, spiritually, your old self is nailed to the cross. And sealed away in the tomb with Jesus. That's what baptism represents. You go underwater. Something dies. But you don't stay there, right? Death is not the end of baptism. You go under so that you can come back up. When the old self dies, something new is born. A new creation. You're born again in Christ. You die with Christ so you can rise with Christ. Come up out of the water. New. Filled with the Spirit. Forgiven and free. See that? It's clear, a clear line. That's the beauty of baptism. There's not a, like, I've been partly baptized. If you were sprinkled as a baby, we can tell that's a little bit. But, but there's, no, there's no fuzziness or ambiguity. Have you committed yourself exclusively, completely, wholeheartedly to Jesus? There's that before and after. The third step on the pathway of faith is obedience. Back in chapter 12, God said to Abraham, go. Go from your country. Verse 4, so Abram went, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him, his, his nephew. Now, if Abram had said in that moment, Lord, I got it. I believe in you. I believe you're the creator. I believe you got a good plan for me, but hold on. I got some stuff I got to attend to here. You know, my wife and I would really like to have a baby first before we get going. 
our, our, you know, our, our ranch and our, our plants, our flocks really have some stuff we need to... If Abraham, had, if he had made excuses and delayed and procrastinated, we would not know him as the man of faith. It's because he heard the word of God and he obeyed. He stepped out in faith, even when there's no way that could have made total sense to him. He had no idea what God had in store. Go to a land, I'm going to show you. It's all the detail he got, but Abram, as a sign of his faith, he obeyed. Now, obedience is the fruit of faith. Obedience is the confirmation of faith. James tells us in the New Testament, faith without works is dead. Jesus says, the, the test of your faith in me is that you hear my words and you do them. Don't deceive yourself by saying you believe in Jesus if you don't obey him. Now, I'm not saying our obedience is what saves us, but our obedience is what demonstrates that we are saved. It's the, it's the fruit that grows from the roots of faith. So if you don't see obedience in your life, where the mark of your life is to know the will of God and to do it, then you, should, you would be right to question whether you truly believe it. Without works, it's a tree without fruit, and a tree without fruit is going to wither and die, and you would be right to question that its root system was healthy. Obedience does not save, but it is the mark of of saving faith. Why do kids obey their parents, or why should they? Because they trust in them, right? Soldiers, yeah, hey man, let's hope so. Soldiers should obey their commanding officers because they trust those commanding officers and the plans that they have for them. Employees should obey their bosses because they trust the leadership of the bosses above them. Church members should obey the leadership of their governing board because they trust that that's a godly group of leaders who is praying and connecting with the Lord. Do you see this? When obedience breaks down, it's because trust is breaking down. That's true in our physical relationships, and it's true of us spiritually. Now, imagine this test in chapter 22. God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there. As a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I wish I would tell you, and Abraham rose early in the morning. Here's the ultimate test. We, we know from Genesis that Abraham is not perfect. But in this moment, this is the crowning moment of his life. This is what everything in his life has been building towards. All of his failures have been preparing him for this. Ishmael has been preparing him for this. All of his other issues with his wife have been preparing him for this. And in this moment, he doesn't hesitate. He doesn't delay. He first thing in the morning, he's like, Isaac, let's go. They get up and they start walking. And Hebrews 11 fills in the detail of what was in his mind. What was it that Abraham believed? What he told Isaac was, God will provide a lamb. And he believed that, that God would provide a lamb. But he assumed the lamb would be Isaac. The sacrifice would be Isaac, his now teenage son. Most scholars believe Isaac would have been 13, 14, 15 years old, which means that Isaac was a willing participant in this thing. He was carrying himself the wood for the sacrifice. Do you see the Christ parallel? The father going to sacrifice his son, the son willingly carrying the wood of the sacrifice and Willingly walking up the mountain in obedience to the Father's will. Both Father and Son believing in the power of resurrection. That's what Hebrews 11 says. Abraham reasoned that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham had no reason to suspect that God would stop him from offering that sacrifice. We know that. He's, oh, God just wanted to see he was willing. No. Abraham, his faith went beyond that to believe 2,000 years before Jesus was born, to believe that God could raise from the dead the child of promise. You see that? <clears throat> who would have thought the long-awaited offspring who would crush the head of the serpent and who through whom the blessing of God would go to the nations, 
Who would have thought that would be accomplished by that child of promise dying? Everyone thought it would be through him reigning, conquering as a king. But here we get a preview of the way God plans to save the world. The child of promise willingly walking up a mountain, carrying the wood of his own execution, laying down his life. The loving father willingly presenting his only son as a sacrifice. And God says, because you have done this, I will bless you. And God did then, of course, provide a lamb. You see this? Repentance, commitment, a clear line, obedience to the Lord, even when it doesn't make sense. That's the, the crowning moment of there's no way that made sense. How often has God done that to you where he says, the thing that you love right now, I'm calling you to let it go. Surrender that job thing. Surrender that relational thing. Let go of that plan you had for your child I'm calling you right now to let go of the thing that you were clinging to. Let it go and watch how I give it back to you. Or watch what I give you in its place. God says, I will bless you. Do we believe that? Are we willing to wait for the, for the way that God wants to bless us? Step four is to pray. Verse eight. There he built an altar. Abraham, he left. He left his homeland in repentance. He went on a new adventure of faith with the Lord. And when he got to that first milestone of arrival in the promised land, he built an altar. And there he called on the name of the Lord. Prayer is the mark of dependence. And this is not just a one-time thing. This is a, a daily dependence on the Lord. That we live a lifestyle of calling on his name and depending on him. A prayerless life is a prideful life of self-reliance. If we are prayerless, we are saying that we don't need the Lord. We don't need His direction. We don't need His power. And we don't trust in His plan. Prayer is our profession of faith in the will and the power of God. And of course, then the application of that is to wait. And this would have been the hardest part of the whole story of Abraham. How many of you are, are like me and, and Diego Montoya and you say, I hate waiting. <laughs> no one likes to wait. No one likes to know. No one intentionally prays for patience. If you've been a believer for a long time, you've learned that lesson, right? The last thing you want to do is pray for patience. You know that the Lord's going to make you wait on something and it's going to feel interminable. Imagine you're Abraham. God, you're 75 years old. He makes this promise. At first, you and your wife are thrilled. We're going to have a baby. A year goes by and you're like, huh. You know? That really could happen. You know? A year that's kind of standard timeline for having a baby. Maybe it'll be two years. Maybe three. I mean, imagine. For them, the breaking point was around year 12. And we can sympathize with that. After 10 years, now instead of being 75 and 65, they're 85 and 75. And saying, Lord, how can this possibly be? How can we trust you for this blessing? We're going to die before this thing is, is going to happen. There's got to be another way. Maybe there's another way. And that's where Ishmael came from. We need to wait for God to give us our Isaac. We need to repent when we give birth to all these Ishmaels, and we need to avoid those. Let me apply this for us to a few, a few groups. If you're single today, if you're young and you're single, or you're single again, or you're in that stage. If you're single, hear this. Wait for your Isaac. Wait for, for your Rebecca, as it were. You read on through Genesis. Wait for the one that God has for you. Don't rush to the first person that might get your attention. Wait on God's timing. He promises to bless you. You hear that? He will bless you. But you have to follow this path of faith. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust. Don't, don't ever trust in your own desires. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, if you're married, hear this. God has promised to bless you. A part of his plan to bless you is your husband or wife, even if it's tough. Even if it feels like sandpaper, it's grinding down your rough edges, that's God's blessing to you. 
Don't take matters into your own hand and try to manipulate and control your spouse. Leave it to the Holy Spirit. He is the trained professional in this area. Be thankful for the one God's given you. Think about, in every life stage, how easy it is to envy those in a different life stage. Before you have kids, all you can think of is, we want to have kids. Once you have kids, all you can think of is, can we get them out of diapers and get them sleeping, right? Once, once they're out of diapers, you're like, can we get them in school? Something, right? And then, and then once they're about halfway through elementary school, you're like, oh, can we have them back in the baby stage, right? And it's so easy to envy other people. Can we be thankful, right? Whatever life stage you're in, can you be thankful and, and praise God for how he is blessing you in the middle of that life stage and take advantage of how you can be a blessing in that life stage. You see how it's all, everything is a test of faith. I know we have several in our church family who are praying for work right now, praying the Lord would open a door of employment. And what a test of faith that is as you have to wait. As days turn to weeks and weeks turn to months, it's one of the greatest tests of faith that we experience today. Many in our church family have loved ones who don't know Jesus or aren't walking with him right now. That's one of the hardest things of all to wait for. To wait on God's timing, to trust in, in his plan, to reach that person in his way. Again, you cannot be the Holy Spirit to someone else. When he opens an opportunity and leads you to speak, you have to speak. But when he tells you to refrain, you need to refrain and be patient and wait on his timing. You see this, faith is the pathway. God calls us to follow. Every stage, every experience. There is a line that marks the beginning of that pathway of faith. That's that moment of commitment to Jesus. There's a line. You cross that. But after that, you're on the path until you die. And the whole point of walking with the Lord is to stay on the path and not stray from it. Now let's look at the rewards of faith. Three rewards in this first promise in Genesis 12. I will make of you a great nation. God promises a people, a community of the redeemed. I will bless you. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. God promises a people and a provision, a provision of blessing. And for your offspring, I will give this land. Brings them into this promised land. A people, a provision, and a place. You can see I stole two of those from Colin and put provision in the middle. So read your OpenTheBible.org, wonderful resources there. Let's look at these uh, in turn. First of all, a people. Connection into community. God's first thing to Abraham is, I will make you a great nation. And of course, we know the fulfillment of that in the, the whole nation of Israel. It took 400 years, but they, they multiplied in Egypt. We'll see that next week. It was enough to freak a pharaoh out. But by the third generation, think about all they had. By the third generation, you've got uh, Abraham and Sarah finally have Isaac. Isaac finally has Jacob and Esau. And how messy did that get? How quick, right? And even Jacob ends up with four wives and 12 kids. And you're like, by the end of Abraham's life, he's like 12 messy, conflicted grandkids who are trying to kill each other. He's like, that's my great nation, Right? Now, you know, like, in, in our world, my, my parents have 10 grandkids, Kristen's parents have 12 grandkids, and we were like, that's plenty of cousins, right? You get together, you're thankful for a basement or a loft, and you throw them in there and close the door, right? Now, imagine the blessing God's describing here for Abraham, an innumerable nation, a people as, as countless as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. Just try and get your head around that promise. And, of course, it's not just ethnic Israel that fulfilled that promise, you and I here today are a fulfillment of that promise. Every believer throughout all of history has been grafted into the olive tree that is Israel, and we share in that blessing. We are the fulfillment of this promise. That's why we can have such confidence that this promise applies to us. You're going to get to parts of the Old Testament that do not apply to us. So be careful as you read. Understand the context of what you're reading, and, and don't go get long tassels and let your side burn grow. You don't have to worry about that stuff, okay? Okay. But certain promises to Israel are overtly and explicitly fulfilled in the church. And this is one of them. The blessing that was to come is Jesus. We share in that blessing. And so God promises to not only bless us with Jesus, but through us to be a blessing to all nations. It's a fulfillment of everything the church is all about and the great commission that he's given us. We are a part of something bigger, this people that God promised to us. And think of the the reward that was 
for Abraham. That even that early fellowship he had before, long before Isaac was born, we find out that he had 318 fighting men. So Abraham, even before Isaac, he already had a kind of weird, twisted little family around him. A community. Isn't that a picture of the church? Must have been well over a thousand people in that early community that was on a mission. They were on a faith adventure together, going somewhere they didn't know where. What a description of church. We're on a journey. God says, go. We say, where are we going? He says, just follow me. But in the process, you become a family. A community, a messy, mixed up community. People from all different backgrounds. All different issues of people. You see the blessing being connected in a community of God's people. The main blessing is through the second one of provision. God says, I will bless you by establishing a covenant with you to be your God. The God of your offspring. And in your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. There were many short-term fulfillments or what looked like the fulfillment of this promise. The child of promise. You think, David, how many of the, in the nation of Israel they said, this is it. This is the one. He's going to crush the head of our enemies. He's going to reign on this throne. He's going to establish the borders. And you're like, yeah, close, right? Close. There's, God certainly used David. He blessed the nation of Israel. He blessed the nations through David, through Solomon, through Hezekiah, through Josiah. But every king of Israel Every priest and prophet, even the patriarchs like, like Abraham and Moses, everyone had issues. Everyone had sin issues in them. And so there was a little fulfillment in these kings and priests and prophets, but not the ultimate fulfillment until the one came who overcame sin completely. And so we see, obviously, the ultimate blessing and fulfillment of this promise, the provision of blessing is in Jesus. And look at this one. When, when God promises to Abraham to multiply and make him into a great nation. It says here in Genesis 15, he believed the Lord. He said, this is what I'm going to hold on to. This is what I'm going to build my life on. This will now be the foundation for my entire faith and life, the promises of God. He believed the Lord, and look at the result. God counted it to him as righteousness. He gave him credit for a perfection that was not his. Genesis could not be clearer that Abraham was not a perfect God. Twice he lied about his wife and basically surrendered her into the harem of two different kings. This is not biblical marriage 101. Certainly when your wife comes to you and says, hey, this maidservant, you want to try that and see how that goes? And he's like, sure, let's do that. Abraham was not totally exemplary in every part of his life. He was not perfect. Before any of that happened, God makes this promise, and Abraham believes God, and God gives him credit for a righteousness that was not his. Think about that. The God who exists outside of time gave Abraham credit for a righteousness that Jesus would win 2,000 years later. When you put your faith in Jesus, God gives you credit for a righteousness that he earned 2,000 years ago. Isn't that wonderfully good news? Look at how Paul says in Romans 4. If you want to enhance your understanding of Abraham, read Romans 4. To the one who does not work but believes in the one who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. This is the blessing, the provision of God. Though you are not perfect and I am not perfect, if you put your faith in Jesus, God sees you as perfect. He gives you credit for a righteousness that is not yours. He counts it to you as righteousness. It's a really simple picture, actually. Imagine you have a rich uncle, you find yourself in financial trouble, and you call your uncle and say, listen, I could can, I can really use some help. And he writes a check to you, and you get this check for $10,000. You sign it, you deposit it, it goes into your bank account. Your bank account jumps by $10,000, and his drops by $10,000, right? You may thank him for rich uncles. That's a transfer. It's a, it's a little simple picture of what happens when you put your faith in Jesus. He gives you credit for his perfection. He fulfilled all righteousness. And he applies that to you. But in order for him to do that in God's economy, he has to take all of your debt and pay it. All of the sin debt for all of mankind was laid upon Jesus at the cross. We get credit for perfection. He had to absorb the debt of all sin. We become righteous because he became sin. 
a provision, a blessing. Finally, briefly, God promised to Abraham a place, a land, the promised land. I'll establish my covenant. I'll give this to you and your offspring. And all the land of Canaan, everything you see, will be your everlasting possession. God promised them a place. A place. And of course, the land of Israel, though it is concrete, though I believe there are still promises God's going to fulfill in history, in that land, God has plans still for ethnic Israel as they will embrace Jesus as their Messiah and He will reign on the throne. I think that's what Revelation 20 is about. I can't get into that today, but the land is a symbol of communion with God. It's a symbol of a return to Eden when God's presence dwelt immediately with His people. They saw that a little bit with the tabernacle and then the temple, God's presence, the glory of His presence in the midst of His people. But always it was ruined by sin. Our hope of that place we will dwell forever is that God's presence will be with us in perfect communion. We will walk with Him like Adam and Eve did in the garden. Do you see the rewards of faith? If we follow this pathway of faith, if we trust in the Lord and His promises and His timing, how that will keep us from temptation. I will keep us on this journey toward blessing, both now and forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for these great and precious promises we have in your word. We thank you for this promise you made to Abraham to bless him. And through his offspring to bless all families of the earth. We're here today to celebrate that blessing. To look to the new covenant, Lord Jesus, that you made in your blood. That we might belong to you. That you might transfer our sin to your account and your righteousness to our account. We praise you for that all-surpassing gift of your mercy and grace. As we prepare to gather around your table, remember and rejoice in this new covenant. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. One more quick story from Abraham.